peptides are the lifeline here. Life flows through an intricate network of countless channels and rivers. A large portion of this vast tract of forest goes underwater twice every day. Lives of every living being, including humans, are tuned to this tidal clock. Silt carried by the Ganges, Brahmaputra and their distributaries over thousands of years has shaped this land, creating the world's largest delta and mangrove forest. Fresh water flows down the rivers and mixes with the salt water from the Bay of Bengal, creating a unique chemistry. This chemistry has not only nurtured an unparalleled biodiversity for thousands of years, but also created a massive protective wall-like mangrove forest that saves Bengal from the wrath of the cyclones. The tide has started receding. Slowly, the mud flats emerge. The entire Sundarbans is now waking up. The fiddler crabs have come out of their burrows and get busy. They have only a few hours to get all their work done. The mud mixed with nutrition is carried with the water. Mud skippers are amphibious fish. They too share an interest in this ever-renewable food source. Birds go into feeding frenzy. While some are residents, <laughs> many others are winter visitors. During winters, as the days in the northern hemisphere shorten, these birds migrate towards the equator in large flocks. The brown-winged kingfishers live in mangroves throughout the year. They are active even during the high tide. Some raptors here are excellent at catching fish. All are now ready for the hunt. Puffy fish owls, a speciality of Sundarbans, can fish even at night with utmost precision. Winter is short here. Through the layers of fog, the world's largest reptile, a saltwater crocodile, swims towards the river junction. It must reach the junction before the high tide starts. The tide will bring the bigger fish. Even though fish is their primary diet, they eat anything they can lay their jaws on. Their deceiving camouflage turns many animals into their prey. And on rare occasions, even humans. By artificially hatching their eggs in controlled situations, the forest department has revived this species from near destruction. Today, Sundarbans has the second largest population of saltwater crocodiles in India. The Northern River Terrapins are commonly known by their scientific name 
but a good basca. They almost became extinct in the wild until a few years back. The forest department is now gradually reintroducing them into the wild through breeding programs. But the most remarkable feature of Sundarbans is its floral diversity. The holophytic plants are dealing with the tide every day and night. Their special adaptations make them extremely resilient. Their roots are submerged in water most part of the day. Pneumatophores rising above the water supply oxygen to the roots. Stilt roots provide extra support in this muddy, watery forest floor. Water carries germinated seeds of Brugera to other parts of the forest. New trees grow. Forest reclaims its land. Towards south, Sundarban meets with the coast of the Bay of Bengal. In some places, the mangrove forest is slowly moving towards the sea. And in some, it's just miles after miles of empty sand and silt beaches. Fresh water is scarce inside the forest. Animals frequent the man-made water reservoirs near the forest watchtowers. The animals can only survive here by constantly being on their toes. For the Sundarban tigers are both fast and agile, be it on land or in water. Tigers are intertwined with the lives of the people living here. During the second half of the 18th century, the British started building settlements by cutting down the dense forest. Hunting the mangrove tigers became a symbol of royal valour. Possibly during this period, the conflict between man and tiger started. It is a common belief that tigers here are specially adapted. Compared to tigers, found elsewhere in India, these swamp tigers are more agile and astute. The Sundarman tigers even prey on fishes, crabs and sometimes venomous snakes. Countless villages lay on the edge of the northern boundary of the Tiger Project. People regularly ventured into the forest for fish, crab and honey. The forest department permits local fishermen and honey collectors to work only in a certain part of the forest. <laughs> Three crab hunters are trespassing into the forbidden part of the forest secretly, avoiding the surveillance of the forest patrol. This tiny old boat is their kitchen, come dining, come living room for the next eight to ten days. They are casting their thread lines right by the edge of the forest. Crabs collected from the last night's lines are then collected inside the hull. They are fully aware that most of the people who die from tigers' attacks are crab hunters.
Is poverty the only reason that forces people to break laws, risk lives? Many fishermen earn a livelihood by fishing legally near the villages. These crabs have high value due to its demand abroad. This lures people to gamble with their lives as a temporary occupation. Efforts have been made to encourage alternate professions with awareness drives in villages. Tourist lodges and resorts are increasing in the surrounding villages. Motorboats are the safari vehicles. Tourism has already become a dependable source of earning for the locals. Forest Department is providing continuous support towards developing responsible eco-friendly tourism infrastructure. In the Indian Sundarbans, there is only one instance in the last few decades of a tiger entering a village and killing a human being. Although tigers venturing into villages to hunt domestic animals is not a rare event. Government takes all the steps necessary to prevent this from happening. Dense forest lies on the other side of the nylon net. Fear of tigers is at every step. But regular maintenance of the net is crucial. The 168 kilometers long net prevents the tigers from entering the village. Workers from the forest department are moving inside the forest to place camera traps. Lack of visibility, soft mud and the hard rheumatophores are making their venture quite challenging. Danger lurks everywhere. These cameras are being placed at spots where tiger movement is most common. Few hundred of these cameras shall record tiger whereabouts from various parts of the forest. This is the most dependable method for tiger senses and understanding tiger movement. But to know the exact location of a particular tiger, there is the radio collar. This male tiger was bait trapped and brought to the Harikali beat office. After tranquilizing him, a collar with a radio transmitter is being placed on its neck. Once released back into the forest, his precise location can be monitored. Bon Bibi, the universal deity of people of Sundarbans, who saves them from the grasp of Tokhin Rai, the king of the forest disguised as a tiger. Both Hindu and Muslim communities have belief in this folklore. Honey collectors start their journey inside the forest only after offering their prayers to Bon Bibi. Honey from the Sundarbans is world-renowned. Forest Department issues permits to collect honey in certain areas in the buffer. department also buys the honey at a fair price. The mask, which is traditionally worn on the back of their head, is to mislead the tiger. But these days, 
the government and the locals are worried about a much larger threat. Consecutive cyclones have already wreaked havoc on Sundarbans. And in this dynamic landscape, there is hardly any hope for the situation to improve. Farming has increased by many folds during the last century. So has the use of river water. Numerous dams and barrages have been built on the rivers to restrict their flow. Freshwater supply from the north has decreased drastically. Sundarbans gets its name from Heritera or the Sundari tree. But due to increased salinity of these waters, trees like Heritera and Nipa are becoming rarer. The landscape is transforming rapidly. The forest has gradually shrunk due to increasing population in the last few decades. By clearing forests and building embankments, we have been using the land to farm crops and fish. Our so-called development has weakened our natural defence. Now the state government has taken a lot of programmes in this, one of which is plantation of mangroves. Though it is very difficult to plant mangroves uh, artificially, but still in the uplands where there are mangroves and people are destroying the mangroves for uh, creation of ponds and other water bodies. So we always uh, try to aware the people that these mangroves should be preserved for the safety of us. So the state government has taken up a massive program where thousands of hectares of uh, plantations are being taken up and to restore mangroves in the coastal areas. Local residents are being used to re-green Sundarbans. Sundarban's wellness is important for the entire Bengal. It's time for us to take some more responsibilities. If nature survives, people shall survive through. If we consciously reduce wastage, are more considerate towards nature and be more careful while making developmental decisions, nature will one day heal all its wounds on its own.